Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the pre-sales edition of the 33 CXOs. Today, we welcome Damon Miller. In this fascinating interview, Damon shares his passion for technology and why he has escaped big corporates post-acquisition to remain within the agile world of the startup. Damon was fast-tracked into a management position and was instrumental in setting the foundations for the highly successful sales and pre-sales partnership at Blade Logic. These foundations are commonly regarded as the gold standard for pre-sales practice today. This is his playbook. of the 33 CXOs, we discover the crucial role that the pre-sales organization played in what is regarded as the greatest success story in the history of software sales. When John McMahon reunited the team at Blade Logic, he had a clear vision to create a sales and pre-sales organization that was in absolute unison. The symbiotic and almost telepathic sales rhythm is the benchmark for best practice. The outcome is not only execution excellence, but a shift to a value mindset which transcends any shift in technology. The pre-sales team now take executive positions at some of the fastest, most disruptive technology companies in the world. What we discover is that John McMahon's vision has not only changed how we sell, it's changed what we sell. Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the pre-sales edition of the 33 CXOs. I'm Simon Kutis and I'm joined by my co-host Patrick Harrison. Brilliant to be here. And it's an absolute honour to be joined today by Damon Miller. Damon, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, gents. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Fantastic to have you here, Damon. It's an honour. Oh, we really appreciate it. In the way of an introduction, Damon Miller newly appointed Senior Vice President of Field Technical Operations at Lacework. First of all, congratulations. I know that it's a, a recent appointment. You've obviously gone and joined uh, Andy Byron, one of the 33 CXOs uh, who we're actually recording with um, as part of the, uh, the third series. Um, and we are going to talk a little bit about your mission at Lacework because I know you are obviously building something quite special um, there with, uh, with Andy. But want to start by going right to the beginning and I suppose the first question for you is where did your passion for technology really start? Yeah it's a great question Simon and, th and thank you for the congratulations it's a uh, it's been a, a, a thrill thus far lace work and I'm, I'm excited to tell you all about it. Um, for me I mean I you know I guess <laughs> if I had to say I don't I don't really know <laughs> where my passion came from but you know, it's pretty clear it's it's sort of genetic, right? I mean, like, you know, since I was a kid, since I was, you know, before I could walk, right? I was I was a tinkerer, taking things apart, you know, during interviews with, uh, with when I interview an SE, you know, they often ask me, like, what what's a quality that um, you see indicating success for people in this role? And, you know, one of my answers is often um, innate curiosity and sort of, I'm just not satisfied until I really understand something. And, you know, th there are many sort of implications of this in life, but, you know, one of them, you'll see my daughter when she asks me a question, you know, I think for a second and I'm sort of like, well, let's, let's talk about that, you know, and she, you just see her sort of roll her eyes and she's like, oh no, here we go again. And it's just, uh, I don't know where it came from, but uh, it's there and it's just part of me. You know, I just, I, I love understanding the way things work. And I think that's sort of what led me into technology and IT and, and ultimately, you know, sales engineering and, and sort of software leadership. Did you have an idea of, what career you wanted to go after? Yeah, I did. Uh, good question. So 
I thought I, so I, I certainly headed down an engineering path. I went to university in, in Boston, Boston University. Um, I studied uh, uh, computer engineering, which was basically electrical engineering, sort of focused on, you know, the digital side of things. And I thought, you know, okay, this is, this is the path. I'll be an electrical engineer. Um, I think as you, as you try doing something sort of uh, more than, as more than a hobby, you learn about yourself. And that was certainly the case for me. I learned that, you know, I didn't really love circuit design and VLSI work. I found it sort of tedious and, and it, it wasn't tinkering for me, you know? And um, so I said, okay, I, I got to figure something else out here. Um, and that, that led me into IT. Um, you know, again, being a tinkerer, you know, I had sort of red hat, I don't even know, back in the mid nineties uh, installed on a bunch of uh, boxes just to, to tinker. And so it was very natural for me to make a move into IT and, you know, network management, storage management, you know, et cetera. And um, so that's, I, I suppose, where I got into industry is really, you know, in, in the IT world. Um, and, you know, ultimately that uh, led into the sales engineering role, which, of course, you know, we can talk more about. And do you think starting in that IT administrator role gave you a, a good kind of broad base of, of knowledge? Oh, absolutely. I mean, certainly, um, you know, if I think about the transition to, to Blade Logic, I'd been, you know, I'd been an IT engineer for, you know, two or three years by that point um, in the startup world. So that was the sort of chaos and, and unpredictability of being in a startup was just second nature to me. You know, I sort of, I don't know, I, that's another aspect of my personality that it, 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 I just sort of thrived there. You know, again, you know, reference my family. My wife is sort of the orderly one. I'm the chaos one, you know, and so it, it works well in that regard. Um, but yeah, Blade Logic was a configuration automation solution. And so, you know, the, the, the company was formed to basically um, help scale uh, data center management and things like patch management, et cetera. But there was really no one at the company who, who had that hands-on admin experience, you know, so I remember so many times, you know, in the early days, um, we'd be having these discussions, you know, Dave uh, Itacheri, our CEO, and Thomas Krauss, the original author of Network Shell, an awesome guy, you know, they'd sort of look around the room and say, all right, well, does anybody know anything about, uh, about you know, Unix or systems or, you know, what these guys do all day? And I'd sort of say, yeah, I, I happen to know a thing or two. And uh, it just, just, I don't know, serendipitously, it just proved to be tremendously valuable in that regard. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And so October 2001, you, you joined Blade Logic, um, very early days, I believe. Um, talk us how that came to pass in joining the organization and, and what you found on, on day one. Yeah, well, um, so I was very uh, fortunate to have a, a friend at the, the company where I was working at the time. Um, he was the CTO, just a, a fantastic guy, Benson Margulies, you know, MIT guy, uh, very, very smart, just sort of genius. And I think he recognized something in me that maybe I didn't see in myself, which is kind of a theme, you know, both uh, happened to me and, and I like to try to think that maybe I can do the same for others. It's a real sort of opportunity of, of hiring and growing teams. But um, anyway, but on the earlier days, you know, he reached out to a friend of his who happened to be Vijay Manwani, the, the CTO of Played Logic, one of the founders, and uh, said, hey, we've got this guy, um, you know, he's an IT guy, you know, it, it might be useful to talk to him, very thoughtful. And um, <clears throat> so I, I called VJ and had a conversation and decided, you know, an interview would make sense. So, you know, in those days, I put on my, my suit jacket, probably the only one I had buried in the closet somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I showed up and um, I remember like so clearly I, I pulled in the office in this ridiculous car I would bought for $500, by the way. It, it was from a, a, a a guy from the Netherlands. And so on the back, it had a giant bumper sticker that said, have you kissed a Dutchman today? <laughs> so anyway, I drive this ridiculous car in and I get out and I think it was a double breasted suit jacket, just completely absurd. I go upstairs to meet VJ and he comes out and he looks at me and he's like, to this day, I remember he was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so it was his actual response. <laughs> and I said, well, this is going well, you know, and it, it ended up going very well. He was just the, the, 
you know, greatest guy. Um, you know, I, I can't say enough positive about him. We, we just had a really good relationship, but mm-hmm. I think he, he also recognized, wow, this guy could be an asset to us. And so, you yeah. know, I, I joined uh, shortly afterward um, and day one, you know, I, I, we were, we were renting some space in a, in another company's office in Lexington. Um, and so we, we probably had, you know, I don't know, 15 or 16 cubes. Um, we would have company meetings in this little sort of kitchen area. Um, and I thought it was fantastic. You know, I got to meet all these people, uh, you know, I got to, to know everyone from the CEO, you know, to, to, you know, QA, we'll talk about Tim, you know, back in those days when he was in that role. Um, I loved it. You know, I said, this is amazing. This is, this is, I gotta, I gotta do more of this. And so it really felt uh, great, you know, from the get go to me and I could add value because, you know, I had done this and I could help automate some things that, you know, back in those days, we, we, part of our challenge was deploying, you know, agents to remote hosts so that we could manage them. And, you know, I said, all right, well, I can script some of this. We'll, we'll do network discovery and find the host out there and then try to connect to them. So Anyway, it, it really felt um, natural. The energy level was very high. The excitement level was high. And, you know, it was sort of off to the races. Mm, fantastic. And prior to that, did you know what pre-sales was? Um, so not, not really. And, you know, I'll, I'll give a qualified answer because in the IT role, we did have to buy, you know, uh, solutions, right? Whether it was backup, storage, you know, network appliances. Though... I, f- I feel like because I was sort of fairly technical by nature um, and maybe because we were, I was at small companies, we didn't really have a tremendous amount of, of sales engineering, you know, support or contact. So mm. it was mostly with the reps, um, you know, contracts and, and pricing and discounts and that sort of stuff, because I, I think I sort of knew what we needed and, and what we wanted. Not that I knew everything, but these were, fairly um, commoditized solutions. You know, it wasn't like the enterprise sales process was needed for us. So I think I knew that that existed because I could ask some questions and I remember somebody on the phone answering them, but I wasn't aware of that really as a career path at the time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. So, so was your first role actually pre-sales or, or did, they kind of, did that kind of just evolve? I think actually, so... It, so Steve Kokinos, another guy you know you, you, you probably have heard of. He was another co-founder at Blade Logic, another fantastic guy. Just you know, he founded a company when he was when he was in college at McGill. Just an awesome guy. Um, I think he he probably said, you know what? I don't know if we have an exact sales engineering role at Blade Logic or or the need just yet. We weren't selling anything. We hadn't really built anything just yet. Yeah. So. I think he and VJ probably talked and Steve said, look, just bring this guy on. We'll figure out what to do with him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so it was, it was a bit of everything. I just sort of jumped in and I said, Oh, I can help here. I can help here. I can offer guidance to the engineering team on, on what to build and why to build it. Um, so I don't, I don't think it was actually an official sales engineering role that came a little bit later when we actually started to sell the thing, you know, and we said, Oh, let's, let's go find, you know, a head of sales who can, who can uh, tell us how to sell this thing. And, and then we'll need a sales engineer as well. Yeah. And then swiftly, well, quite early on, you were actually um, promoted to more of a, a management responsibility quite early within your career. How did that come about? Well, I think uh, at some point along the way, we, we realized that, you know, we're going to have to hire more sales engineers. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, and, and I'm trying to remember the exact sequence of events, but uh, it just sort of happened because it needed to happen, I suppose. There, you know, I, I see a theme here at Blade Logic, which is, you know, hey, we we got a problem. I don't know exactly how to solve it. Just get that person to do it, you know, <laughs> and, which I guess is normal in, in the startup world. You know, you don't have time to, to lay out a three-year playbook and, and, and go execute against it. Um, so I think... I'm trying to remember. I think it was Vance actually came to me, Vance Loisel. Um, you know, I remember all of these guys fondly. So if you hear me speak positively about everyone, it, that's the reality. You know, I, yeah. I just, I loved the time I spent with all those folks. But anyway, Vance, uh, another, you know, co-founder, um, 
I think at the time might have been running oh might have been running product management it's been a while but yeah okay um so i think you know vance probably said look we're going to need somebody to grow this team and manage it you know all right damon what do you think okay sure you know can't be that hard (laughs) little did i know but you know at the time you know we're all wide-eyed and sort of excited so uh i think it it sort of came about like everything else which is like all right let's try this (laughs) yeah and how at the time of uh, of that transition to management, Damon, had you um, built a kind of pre-sales playbook alongside the sales team or um, was that an ever-evolving kind of thing? It was definitely evolving. Um, we, you know, I think I, I'm, think I'm sort of merging together a number of events. You know, Steve Strahan joined, you know, roughly around that time. And he brought a ton of uh, structure, and rigor around qualification, you know, medic, of course, med pick, you know, whatever the sort of variation is. Um, and he sort of um, crystallized our, I guess, our understanding of the market and the pain that we were addressing. And I think along with that came a sales playbook, which involved a sales engineering playbook. Um, that's when we really formalized you know, the, the notion of, okay, here's the discovery process. Here's the trial prep process. You know, I put together a, a POC test plan, you know, that we then used and was modified many, many times by many people over the years, but um, that at least sort of focused the team. Um, you know, I remember uh, putting together uh, demo scripts and back in those days we would ship uh, physical drives. We all had uh, IBM you know, think pads and we had these, uh, you know, we had to get the fastest drive because we ended up starting like seven VMs on this poor machine. And I, I remembered at some point we shipped that, you know, I, I trained the team, um, you know, and we were, we were sort of off to the races. And then a couple of weeks later, somebody noticed the timestamps and the, the dates on the um, VMware, you know, workstation disk images. And it was December 25th. You know? <laughs> and they were like, Damon, <laughs> Did you, did you, were you bored on Christmas? And I said, yeah, I guess so. You know, you, you did what you needed to do. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't a hero move for me or anything like that. It was just, I had some time it needed to be done. And somebody else, you know, kind of amusingly noticed it later and asked about it. But yeah, I think we didn't really have a playbook, but, you know, in, in partnership with Steve and, and his sort of uh, efforts to crystallize the the process, I think, that's really when we, we began to build one. Yeah. So um, probably around that time is Marty Carty as well. And I know that you and he were, were, were very, very kind of close, oh, yeah. you worked very closely together. Um, and a lot of the stuff you actually had to go and work out, you know, out on the field. So, so tell us a little bit about that partnership and, and how that really started to steer the direction, you know, from, from a proposition. Um, of blade logic sure yeah marty just an amazing guy i mean he's he's just one of the smartest uh hardest working um persistent <laughs> individuals <laughs> that you could ever hope to to meet um he's got a huge heart as well just a just a great guy um so i think in those days i was managing but also you know, was, there were some areas where we just didn't have capacity. And, and so I would get engaged in individual deals, um, you know, to, to, well, because it needed to be done. So Vanguard is one such example. And that's one I remember distinctly with Marty. It, you know, prior to that, we were really focused a lot on the, um, the infrastructure, you know, the operating system and a little bit of middleware, but really things like patch management and, you know, software distribution of the middleware and, and, kind of configuration of the operating system. And, you know, we spent some time with Vanguard and uh, we pretty quickly realized that to those folks, um, they didn't really care about the operating system. I mean, it was there to serve a purpose, but somebody else managed that, you know, that was just the, the, the foundation on which they deployed their apps. It was a big J2EE shop. I think it was WebSphere. Um, and so, their sort of model, there was like a, you know, what do we call it? An impedance mismatch between our um, expectation and theirs. Namely, we were viewing the world as a a server by server sort of basis where, okay, we pushed to this server, we moved to the next server, et cetera. 
they carved up the world into j 2 double apps. They might have seven deploys, but they really all go to one operating system instance because that's how they were structured. And so we knew there was tremendous opportunity. Marty knew that and, and he was you know, insistent and, and said, look, man, we can solve this. I know we can. And, and that was one of his greatest you know, assets was like a, an undying you know, faith, right? And I don't even know if it was, if it was faith or just momentum. You know? <laughs> I don't know. But he, uh, he was right. And so I kind of went back to engineering and, and I said, all right, guys, here's the situation. There's, there's half a million bucks to be, to be earned here at least. And this is going to last for a long time if we can figure it out. What can we do to uh, change the way in which we view the world, um, you know, and, and deploy to app instances instead of operating systems? And, you know, at first there was some grumbling and like, oh, God, here he comes again. You know, he's going to divert you know, <laughs> the entire roadmap for two years. And I was like, no, trust me on this. There's real opportunity. And, and you know, I remember working with so many engineers. Abai, you know, Balambe stands out and, you know, Ravi Reddy, just great guys that, uh, you know, they listened to our madness. And they said, okay, well, let's, let's figure it out. Um, John Whitney, another example, just a fantastic guy. He, we sort of realized, all right, maybe this is something we can do. We, we literally changed the model so that instead of deploying to servers, we would deploy to, um, oh, I forget what we called them. It might have been containers, but before the sort of Kubernetes, you know, Docker, yeah. you know, world. Yeah. Um, and along with that, we realized, okay, we're going to need to parameterize some of these things our deployment packages because they had all this complex configuration stuff and operating system wouldn't cut it. We would need to like take out, you know, bits and pieces and replace them with variables so that the Vanguard team could say, all right, we're going to push to um, prod, you know, instance one app four and set these properties, you know, which would be inherited by the deployment system. I know this is getting a little bit in the weeds, but bear with me because it's pretty cool. Um, we then took that to engineering, John Whitney, and we said, all right, how do we do this? And he thought about it and he's like, all right, I got an idea. We'll come up with this thing called the property dictionary. And, you know, he built this in, in I don't even know, like a week or something. We showed it to Vanguard. They're like, that's exactly what we need. And, uh, you know, we then, you know, productionalized, productized it, uh, you know, sort of QA'd it, et cetera. And it was a phenomenal success story. It worked. Marty was 100% right. Um, <clears throat> We stayed with it, and and I can't say enough about John Whitney. He, you know, he didn't sort of uh, react negatively. He was like, "All right, let's think about it," and you know, he had a solution. It was pure genius. And so, anyway, yeah, that transformed uh, our offering. Sort of brought us up the stack a bit to what the application folks cared about, which is where the money is. You know. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, great, great question. <clears throat> yeah. So obviously, um, it, it's well documented how complex the blade logic solution was and obviously the the challenges that brings with you building a pre-sales team obviously would reflect that so how did you handle hiring a team to be able to be able to sell or support the sales um from from a pre-sales team perspective yeah it it was a challenge um you know in those days you you sort of had the traditional sales engineer, which was really, I'll call it a bit of a sales role. And what I mean is, I mean, I, I view the sales engineering uh, role as squarely part of the sales team. But what I mean in order to distinguish is um, often, you know, the, the, the folks that call it EMC, you know, that were uh, sales engineers, they didn't really do uh, POCs um, and they weren't that, technical. I don't mean that to be insulting to them, but there were teams that handled the technology. They sort of um, bridged the gap, I guess, between technical and pure sales. That's valuable, but it wasn't what we needed. So, you know, I I sort of, I looked at at staffing up, I looked at growing the team, and I kind of thought, well, this doesn't feel right. You know, I, I don't really think that we need to pursue that. And, you know, Dave and Vijay and everyone were like, okay, great, do what you need to do. So there was another positive thing from those folks. There was trust and there was never any pushback. So I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to go find um, people with admin experience and later people with application, you know, management experience and maybe even network experience because eventually we had to deal with network devices, storage, even security. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I told the recruiters, I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. Um, change the profile. Forget about finding somebody with sales engineering in the title because that's not going to work for us. Find somebody that was a sysadmin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I sort of got, are you sure? I mean, we're talking about, you know, people that, you know, are in the eighth sub basement and maybe, you know, haven't seen the sun in 15 years. And I said, no, trust me on this. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And it was tremendous for us. You know, we, um, I remember, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Sung Park, Awesome, awesome guy. Um, he's gone on to do great things. Maybe I'll, I'll ask him for some shares in Mongo or something. But <laughs> he, uh, he was a SQL um, database administrator, I think at Morgan, I think at the time, Morgan Stanley. Um, uh, and, you know, and Frank Coppola and I sort of interviewed him and we said, all right, this is fantastic, you know. And uh, Sahir Azam is another guy. He was a, a web administrator. Um, I've forgotten the company. It was in New York. Um, I interviewed him and, and uh, you know, it was hard to actually find candidates that we wanted because it was a pretty good balance. You had to have someone that could present, you know, and, and you know, had um, uh, aptitude for sort of uh, interaction with, with prospects, but I needed, you know, pretty deep technology experience. And with Sahir in particular, you know, we were in this, uh, this breakfast cafe in Jersey city. He lived in Jersey city at the time. <laughs> and um, you know, I'd interviewed like nine people and it, it, it got a little tiring, you know, and I was always like, Oh boy, here we go again. You know, but I met Sahir and we had this, uh, <clears throat> we had, we, you know, we, at the time we had a bit of a weakness, you know, I'll, I'll just call it what it is. And that was multiple sites, you know, like we needed, three different data centers. If someone came to us with that problem, we had to keep them in sync and, you know, replicate. That was the expectation people had from the storage world. And, uh, you know, it was, every time someone asked about that, you sort of had this feeling like, uh Oh, <laughs> you know, here we go. So I told to hear what we did. I talked about the architecture and you could see him think for like two seconds. And then he was like, well, I have a question for you. What if someone has multiple data centers and you have to keep them in sync? And I was like, all right, we have a winner here. You know, <laughs> it was just immediate with him. I said, all right, we got to hire this guy. And we did. And again, another guy that's, that's just phenomenally successful. He's like the chief product officer at Mongo. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a non-traditional um, profile at the time. I think it's become more traditional, um, but it worked really well for us. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad I, I don't know. The, the timing was right. And I sort of said, well, let's try, let's try this because it worked out well. And had you crystallized what you needed from a, a personality trait perspective at that point? Was, were there certain characteristics you were looking for as well as the technical skills or was it just? Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, you know, first, you know, we're, as you've probably spoken with Mike Lupiani, a good friend of mine, <clears throat> we've known each other for years, as he puts it, all of the SEs that are successful, we're all broken, but kind of in the same way. <laughs> and he's right, you know, that there's, now that's obviously hard to, to sort of uh, uh, qualify in, in an interview, but we're all a little quirky. <clears throat> we all, you know, we're all tinkerers. We all have that innate curiosity and that, that sort of lack of, of satisfaction unless we really understand how something works. So that's, I talk about that you know, as, as a personality trait, mm -hmm. um, curiosity, coachability is incredibly important to me. Um, you know, I'll take someone who's junior and willing to learn and, and very coachable over someone who has all of the experience, but, you know, has a, a chip on their shoulder because that's just, it's mm -hmm. just unpleasant mm -hmm. to the team and to the manager, et cetera. So, you know, coachability, um, you know, that curiosity I talked about, a passion to, to, to build and, and, you know, um, you know, we'll talk about the playbook in a bit, but basically being a, um, a contributing sort of participant in the organization, not just an employee, you know, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that, but yeah, those are some of the traits I look for, you know, the, the usual as well, integrity and work ethic and, and, you know, but those are fairly easy to, to, um, explore. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And obviously bringing in uh, really high potential individuals with a strong, broad technical background. Um, maybe for our viewers, you know, looking to 
to grow their own pre-sales team in a similar way. Um, was it quick to get people up to speed? Were they able to get out what, to do a POC within a short time? Or we, You know, I think in those days we looked, I mean, again, it was so chaotic. Um, mm. it, it, because we hired technical people with often with admin experience, <clears throat> this mm. was, it was kind of second nature to them. So the technology part um, of what we were managing wasn't that um, much of a challenge for them. Now, you know, there were some architectural, you know, quirks in the product and there were some product limitations and sort of how to integrate into the organization and process, you know, those, those took some time, but really, you know, if you hire the right people um, with the right technical experience, you know, they're going to get up to speed quickly. You know, I was most recently, you know, at um, <clears throat> VMware by, by way of the cloud health acquisition. And our goal there was, you know, basically a 90 day ramp to full productivity. And that was sort of um, a product certification, demo certification, and then trial certification. Mm -hmm. um, we had, you know, formal uh, product certification, essentially a test and all sorts of material. Um, you know, we built a program around demo enablement, you know, sort of mentored, um, then you lead with support and, and then you lead on your own. And then the trial uh, stuff there really revolved around um, qualification and establishing a test plan. And, you know, so similar type things, I think a 90 day plan is, is very doable. And, you know, at Lacework where we've got that down even lower in many cases, you know, so um, I think if you hire the right people with the right uh, experience and a willingness to learn and, and adapt to the process, you know, that, that problem isn't significant. In terms of, um, you know, the, the, the modern day, why do you think vendors or pre-sales teams aren't hiring more from customers if, if there is such a good matchup? Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think of examples where we actually have done that. Um, there have been some examples. Uh, um, I think... Well, somewhat, obviously, you run the risk of damaging the relationship with the customer. You know, I mean, you know, you, you steal their best person and, you know, they tend to be sour about it. <laughs> There's that. Um, as you're seeing my, the sun, I, I talked about the sun never making an appearance in, in New Hampshire. Well, it, it, this is like the one out of 360 days that it looks like it will. So I may uh, close the blind in a moment. But um, I think there's that aspect. Uh, often depending on the person, they may have very specific expertise in uh, an application level, you know, um, uh, or an application focus that might not translate to broader infrastructure, if that makes sense. That could be another reason. Um, but some, you know, we do have inbound interests, you know, we, 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 and this happened a lot. We sell the products, um, to an organization, you know, Blade Logic, for example, we'd have admins using it, and they'd say, "Man, this is awesome! Like, I'm looking for something bigger. I want to be part of this." And so it did happen. Um, you just have to approach those conversations somewhat delicately. You know, you, often you do it the right way. You call the uh, the uh, the buyer or your champion and say, "Look, um, here's the situation. I want to be open about it. You know, express it." And and you know, more often than not, they'll say, "Wow, that could be a great opportunity for him or her." Um, Let's make it work the right way, you know? Mm. Yeah, sure. So at this time, um, you're obviously now balancing your role between managing a team, actually, you know, leading kind of technical discussions and sales. So tell us a bit about, you know, where you focus more of your time or, or how you kind of sharpen the various skills in order to be able to cope with the breadth of that role. Yeah, well... Um, it helps a lot to have uh, someone like Andy who, you know, went through the, the John McMahon, you know, um, system <laughs> playbook, you know, everything from medic to, to focus on qualification and, you know, qualify out early and, and control the process. And so that, you know, that means I have complete trust in my partner, uh, Andy, in that regard on the sales team to, you know, own and sort of manage and, and um, hold accountable the sales team. He trusts me to do the same for the sales engineers. So in terms of balance, I think it's really um, 
it's really at first about that relationship with the, the sales leader and, and, and the trust that you need to establish there first, because when that's in place, I don't need to uh, manage, if you will, the sales reps themselves, you know, they're, they've got leadership up and down the organization that um, is in place and will hold them you know, accountable the right way. That means I can focus on the SEs and driving that partnership. That's an aspect that's very important to me. You know, ask anyone who's worked for me, they'll, they'll tell you, yeah, we, we often talked about being equals with the sales reps and our opinion and our perspective being equally important in driving, you know, that uh, um, uh, validation and qualification. So I guess for me, it's not, that I have to spend a tremendous amount of time sort of coming up with sales qualification process, but rather I just work with the SEs to say, okay, has the, uh, you know, what's the rep feel about this? Is this a qualified opportunity? What do you feel about it? I make sure that they're having that conversation and then I can focus on, you know, the technical uh, aspect. So okay. yeah, that was sort of my, uh, my focus on the, on the, do I need to handle, you know, sales qualification or, or SC qualification often sure. with the right structure in place, the sales process will handle itself. And my job is, is really just to sort of monitor that to make sure it's happening and then focus on this, on the technical side. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I suppose as, um, you know, Steve Strahan was obviously there um, kind of before John McMahon. John McMahon obviously came in. Um, a lot of what had been kind of done was now built on through John McMahon. Did that change your focus or have, you know, not necessarily your focus to be more salesy, but really understand more of the, of the kind of, the, 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 the kind of core competencies or execution of that methodology in order to really partner with the uh, with the sales org yeah absolutely um <clears throat> steve steve's just amazing um i remember early you know shortly after he joined we all got in a room and he got a whiteboard out and he said okay guys you know what do we do <laughs> we we're like what do you mean what do we do you know we're this we're a software company we sell software you know and he's like okay great but why do we do that you know and it was you know we were all sort of like who is this guy? Did, did they tell him why they hired him, you know? And, you know, I think we even, we sort of, I, I don't know, ran the risk of <clears throat> underestimating him at that point saying, what, what's going on here? But it was actually brilliant because we didn't know what we did or why we did it. It was the absolute truth. And in that session and throughout subsequent ones, we established a set of core differentiators. We established our mission, you know, we established our target audience and, you know, Steve would say, you know, look, I'm not a, I'm not a rocket scientist. Um, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I know you have to understand the pain. You have to understand the buyer and you have to find a, a, a sort of intriguing way to express value. And he was a hundred percent right. Um, so that was very eye opening to me because, you know, we'd, we'd been sort of doing our best but no one had stepped back and said, wait a minute, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> you know, and why? So that was, was tremendously valuable to me. And, and I know Steve, he, he would always sort of say, well, that's just, that's what you do. It's part of the job as if it were just sort of mundane, but you know, it was so valuable to us. And uh, you know, we, we all owe Steve a huge gratitude because that allowed the company to, to sort of really begin scaling. <clears throat> mm. Sure, and then the the John McMahon um, period of of taking over and and ramping yeah. up did that see a huge growth in terms of your your team as well? Yeah, at that point we were in full uh, scale mode. You know, at that point, which um, you know John you know came on board. He had sort of managed very very large teams, and and his focus because we had we'd sort of gotten through that initial like why do we exist and who are we selling to and what does this thing do? And now it was like, okay, we've proved the basics. All right, now let's grow this thing, you know, toward ultimately toward an exit, which was, you know, in our case, an IPO and later acquisition, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, to, that was sort of the next phase in, in learning for me, which is okay. Now I get to see um, an operator for lack of a better description who's done this before, who 
scales organizations and, and they, they know what scaffolding to put in place, you know, where, you know, and it was just things like, okay, you get to six or seven directs. All right. You need a, you need a director here. You then need an area VP, you know, and just on the sales side. And so we kind of looked to, to follow that lead uh, on the SE team. And I worked for John, um, spent a ton of time with him. Obviously, you know, the guy's just tremendous. Um, just a great guy to work with always, direct open and he's actually also hysterical which you know <laughs> may not always come across obviously but he's he's just a hysterical person you know to, to be around so I, I fully enjoyed all the time I spent with him and I still call him and that's in fact how I came to be connected with lace work I was just you know starting to to look around a bit and um I gave John a call in, in characteristic John form. He's like, Damon, call Andy, call him immediately. You got to call him right now. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> yes, sir. Right away. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's uh, it was a lot of fun and very educational to sort of watch that next phase um, and learn from him as he, as he showed us how to, to scale, you know, a business. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. And, Obviously, the acquisition was shortly after the IPO. How, how was that um, build up to IPO and, and that experience quite early was, on in your career? It was crazy. I mean, it, it just all of the, the structure you have to put in place, you know, particularly on the finance and HR side. I mean, that's all good and important stuff. Um, it, that was new to me as well. I hadn't been through it before. So, you know, we're hiring uh uh, tons of, of finance, you know, controllers and coordinators. And obviously you need to get a CFO in place. And um, uh, so that was also educational. You know, I, I, if I'm not learning something, you know, I sort of get bored and um, mm. I certainly had a ton to learn all the way from the earliest days at Blade Logic to post IPO to see how uh, a public company was operated, you know, Dave um, earnings calls. I mean, just, all of that, that stuff was new to me and it was tremendously valuable. So yeah, it was also interesting and, and uh, was, certainly we continued to scale on the sales side, but really we had to sort of shore up all of the, the pieces that were um, just not yet in place from a, a, an operational standpoint. And that was really compelling and interesting to watch. Mm. Mm. So, uh, uh, so after the IPO, BMC happened, but you didn't hang around three months. No. And you were you were gone. How did you know That's that true. you didn't want to hang around? Oh, I think, you know, honestly, as you as you you get older, you learn about yourself, hopefully. And you know, I was I was still pretty young-ish in those days. Um, I think I I knew I think I wanted to get away from a big company. I had an idea of what a big company was in my mind. Mm. And, you know, I, I think I probably didn't give BMC a fair chance, you know, to be honest. I mean, I, I can be my own um, harshest critic. Um, and, you know, by no means am I, am I perfect, you know. I just, I probably, yeah, I don't think I gave BMC a, a completely fair chance. And I, I just said, all right, let's go back to something that um, is smaller and that, you know, I know well. And that's okay. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, uh, well, if you look at, at my career, I mean, I stayed a little longer at Verizon and I stayed for two years at VMware. Um, so, uh, and VMware is a substantially larger company than, than VMC was at the time. So, um, you know, big companies that that's probably one thing that i learned uh, and continue to learn is is just because a company is large doesn't mean that it's inherently uh, uh uh bad or or you know you can't succeed there there's opportunities everywhere and uh um so for me i think you know i said all right let's let's just go back to something small and 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 join you know steve uh whom i knew you know, and, and love dearly and, and Derek, you as well, the CTO at, at thinking phone networks, you know, what, what, and became fuse, et cetera. So um, anyway, I guess that's a bit of um, introspection, you know, on the matter. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that gives you some insight. 
Mm. Did you expect that Blade Logic would have the impact? You know, perhaps looking back now and seeing the impact that Blade Logic had at BMC, and there's absolutely no reason for you to regret anything because you've had an, an incredible career. Thank you. But had you been able to preempt that impact, might you have hung around in, in, in hindsight? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there were a number of people that stayed at BMC for quite some time. Yeah. Um, Tim, Tim Fesnant fantastic guy you know had a had a great uh run there um so you know bmc ran into some problems later with the private equity you know move etc um but even then you know there was opportunity and you know they're they're they work to retool their business and sort of you know become a bit more modern so yeah i think so um i mean simon you know like i said you, you kind of learn a bit about yourself as you get a little older and you, maybe you're not so so quick to, to judge or quick to, um, you know, seek something that's familiar, you know, maybe try something a little different. So I think so. Mm. And what was there a sense within Blade Logic at the time of, of how impactful on the industry this would go on to be? Or was it just a case of always aiming high at the time? Um, I think it was a case of always aiming high. I remember, you know, BMC worked very hard to fit us into their uh, their sales kickoff. I mean, it was like, I don't even know, like two weeks after the acquisition was, you know, finalized. They amazingly accommodated us, um, which was a ton of work, I'm sure, by a ton of people. And like suddenly they have hundreds of people that need to be fit into this situation. And I can only imagine, you know, Bob, <clears throat> the uh, CEO, you know, back then coming to his team and saying, all right we need to add like 300 people to the kickoff. And they're like, Oh my God, what are you talking about? But they did it. And uh, you know, that was very, very uh, thoughtful of them. Um, I think I remember being at the, the kickoff and you know, we knew one another at blade logic. Of course we didn't really know BMC. And so it was this sort of dance of getting to know one another a little bit, but I think we, we kind of, collectively started to realize, wow, we could have a pretty big impact here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not that, that they weren't successful. It was just this sort of different sales model and, and uh, levels of, I don't know, aggression, perhaps. That's, and I'm using that word knowing that it has some negative connotations. <laughs> um, so I think we probably realized that we could make a big impact and, and uh, you know, but maybe not as big an impact on both the company and the industry as we, as, as sort of turned out to be. So um, you went, you made your way over to Fuse um, June, 2008 and um, July, 2009. It's interesting with Fuse because a lot of the kind of, well, Luca Lazaron and the likes of Bill Strogis and many of the other guys actually made their way to Fuse, but it wasn't for seven or eight years after you'd, you'd right. kind of made, you've, you've left. So um, yeah. it's quite interesting. You went quite early. Um, so <clears throat> how do you kind of reflect on that? Um, you know, I think I knew Steve really well. I knew Derek really well. Um, Love those guys. I was looking for, something smaller, you know, as we sort of talked about, I was, you know, perhaps just seeking, you know, a, an organization that was run by folks that I knew, you yeah. know, really well, a smaller, you know, company. Um, so I think Steve or Derek reached out to me and, and I said, all right, cool, let's go for it. At the time, you know, it was quite early. They were, they were just getting the, the, you know, hosted, you know, PBX hosted phone business off the ground and both wanted to explore, um, uh, you know, an, an application, an ASP style offering, you know, I think by then we were calling it SaaS, but, um, you know, they were looking at things like hosted um, uh, trouble ticketing systems, hosted CRM, you know, hosted um, uh, video, you know, as well. And so it was appealing to me because I could explore, you know, that stuff uh, with their full blessing um, to see what was possible. Um and, uh, you know, we did, but it was so early, you know, I mean, there was no question about it. Like you said, later, you know, the, the scale, you know, folks came, Luca, you know, whom I worked with many, many times. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, 
it wasn't quite time, you know, yeah. for that sort of broad application you know, offering. But look, I'm still a shareholder and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, all right, <laughs> maybe something here, you know, so I, uh, I don't, you know, you can't look back and, and, and sort of feel negative, you know, emotion or energy. You, you got to learn. And I have only positive things to say about Steve and team and Derek and, um, but it was just early, man. It was, it was, it was very, very early and, you know, it wasn't quite ready for that, uh, breadth, I guess. Sure. So for, for our viewers, I guess, I guess it's about finding that balance between too early and still, you know, that pure startup where you can have that huge impact like Blade Logic. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, that's a t- that's sort of like timing the market, you know, <laughs> they say, you know, you got a dollar cost average, but I, I guess my career hasn't been about dollar cost averaging <laughs> so much as it has trying to time the market. You can take educated guesses, you know, I've yeah. had the, the good fortune of, of being in touch with people who, you know, have demonstrated uh, an ability to identify, you know, uh, growth opportunities. And, um, you know, that's, it's I'm very fortunate in that regard, but you know, you, you take chances and um, I found that's, that's what works best for me. Um, you know, I think uh, others might look at me and sort of say, man, this guy's crazy, <laughs> you know, but I, uh, I don't know. I sort of enjoy the chaos and it's worked out and uh, you know, I'm very thankful for that. So yeah, it's tough to time the market, but you, you can take an educated guess. You put your, your trust in people that you know and people that have succeeded in the past, of course, and, and people who are willing to work hard for you and with you. And, you know, that's what I've always tried to do. And um, you know, it's worked out, well and and i'm i'm working hard now to make it work out well again you know and have tons of faith in in uh everyone i work with and and lace work sort of mission and so you know we'll see if we can you know <laughs> repeat some of that success <laughs> absolutely so you made your so after fuse uh july 2009 you made your switch over to cloud switch yeah, um, right. where you joined as de- director of technical field operations um and you were brought over i believe by ellen rubin um right. and subsequently it was also high it was also um, acquired by verizon um around a similar time when they acquired terramark and you kind of found yourself in a in a kind of a, a, a role within verizon at that time so so just tell yeah. us a little bit about you know that transition and and, and what you started to learn during that time yeah. So, um, you know, cloud switch, another early, early play, very cool technology. We could essentially run a, an unmodified VMware VM, take the VMDK and OVA, we could run it on AWS. And, you know, those are two different hypervisors as you, you know, probably are aware, um, totally different architectures, et cetera. The only way to do that is nested hypervisor. So we would essentially run a modified version of, of a virtual box on top of Zen, you know, the, the AWS hypervisor, sort of like inception, you know, it was this crazy uh, architecture, but it worked. We could, and, and we set up a, a, a software, you know, layer two bridge. So we'd boot this VM in AWS and it would, you know, pixie boot or broadcast it be on your subnet locally. It was just very, very cool. And it, it provided a very, um, sort of niche uh, way to extend the data center. So Verizon looked at that and they looked at Terramark, you know, they had this big private cloud um, uh, solution that was, you know, very successful. And they said, all right, we want to, we want to bridge the gap to the public cloud as well. They wanted to become, you know, a cloud provider. So that's what sort of drove the acquisition. Uh, Now um, my role became, you know, I was in the, in the channel team, you know, a sales role and it was, you know, director of ISV, you know, sales or channel sales. So Verizon innovates in many ways, but I think one of the main ways is by combining different um, components that they've acquired. Um, They do have a software team, of course, and they'll build software, but that's not really their core business. Obviously there's the wireline and, and wireless, but Verizon Enterprise, um, they innovate, among other ways, by, by integrating solutions that they've acquired. And that's really where this was. So it was, it was cool for me to, you know, have exposure to, to a, a sales role. Um, and it, it took a little while for me to sort of, 
figure out how to operate myself, meaning, you know, I, okay, who do I sell to? What do I, what do I do? And so I think we kind of, I, I realized, well, this is again, pretty niche, but I was talking to a, a fleet management uh, company and, and they had a need for sort of tracking all their um, vehicles and devices, but they had on-prem, you know, uh, software they had, um, you know, they were trying to get to the cloud. And so cloud switch and Verizon's IOT, you know, offering at the time um, was kind of interesting. So that, that's an example of um, how, you know, I came to sort of bridge those things, you know, together. Um, again, you know, if I thought, if I thought BMC was a big company, you know, Verizon was like, Verizon was like a, a galaxy, you know? So um, n- no shock to anyone who, who knew me or, you know, at the time that I might look to, to move on. And, uh, you know, I did of course, and and that led me to sumo logic. <clears throat> mm, fantastic. And yeah. obviously that was a, uh, a, a real getting back together of, of so many key players from. from yeah, there. definitely. Yeah. Vance was the CEO, you know, at the time and just, you know, had a ton of fun. Um, I'll spare you the story of my, my interview, which, involved being stuck on a cal train you know at, at between midnight and 5 a.m because vance was too cheap to pay for an uber but you know <laughs> look we'll we'll save the details of that for later <laughs> i had a flight at like seven the next day you know it was, yeah. it was a great time but you know that's just that's just for me it was kind of more of the same it was like all right i'm i'm back with the band now <laughs> yeah. so yeah i had a ton of fun and obviously they went public uh you know whatever, almost two months ago now. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm monitoring that closely as I'm sure a lot of people are. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And that was quite a new technology for you. It was your first kind of foray into the security world in a way or. That's right. Security. I mean, back then, in fact, you know, there, there was a guy named Bruno Kurtick who, uh, who, you know, runs product, you know, for them mm. and, you know, really, really smart guy. You know, if you mention my name, Bruno's, probably, he'd probably roll his eyes like, Oh God, because we, we would, uh, we'd occasionally disagree, you know, about direction though. I always knew his heart was in the right place. You know, yeah. um, one of the areas that the field, um, constantly got pulled was security. Like, Hey guys, you've got this big data platform. You can ingest arbitrary data. You can alert on it. You can find patterns, et cetera. Mm. Can we use it as a SIM? And, you know, so I'd go back to Bruno. I'm like, man, I think we might have something here. And he's like, Damon, we're not a SIM. You know, there's ArcSight. There's a, and he was right. Yeah. They'd spent years and years building that stuff. And we, you know, we didn't really have the right compete. Now, Sumo absolutely, you know, is a SIM. And they position themselves just as Splunk, you know, does. Mm. And they're successful with it. Um, now, it's not that Bruno was wrong. It just took a while to get to the point where they had the capability to, to offer value in that regard. And so it's great to see that. But, yeah, um, in the earlier days, it, we didn't focus on security. It was just pure unstructured data analysis, um, Mm -hmm. you know, helping folks make sense of like this crazy world of information that was just overwhelming to them. Mm -hmm. Also, it was a cloud solution. So, you know, Splunk was primarily selling on-prem. They didn't have to buy, you know, three racks of of disks and and compute and network and all that stuff. You know, we said, hey, we might have, we might not have every capability that Splunk has, but, you know, we've got certainly minimum viable product take a look at us, then you can get rid of all that stuff. You don't have to, you know, pay people to, uh, to manage it. So that, that was a compelling aspect as well. So yeah, I really, I wanted a cloud SaaS, you know, play. I wanted a big data uh, focus and that really gave it to me, which was, it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. So you were obviously there very early on. So it was pretty much yourself, Mark, Steve, Vance, um, setting the strategy day one. So, You've obviously had quite a lot of experience of running the playbook previously, back mm. with the band. What was your primary focus day one as your kind of main objectives in setting this up in the right way? Yeah, well, um, so I joined, um, it was sort of like the first class of, of sales, you know, like uh, Chris Healy, uh, a guy that I worked with very closely, 
you know, a hell of a sales rep, but sales leader as well. He's based in the Boston area. Um, you know, no one had really sold in the East yet. And, you know, we were both in the East, I think, because, you know, locale, Silicon Valley, you know, et cetera. So I think we had to figure out um, what do we really have here? Because you sort of have this utility knife with, with Sumo. This is always one of the challenges. You know, early, early days, we'd go to people and we'd say, hey, we got this awesome uh, thing. It does all kinds of stuff, you know. You have any pain? <laughs> you know, like, sure. I mean, you know, physically or emotionally or we, what are we talking about here? You know, so we, we had to to focus that message on um, a set of use cases. And of course, those became things like log management, log analytics, storage, um, alerting. Then, and this is where, you know, hiring the right uh, sales engineers becomes very important in a way we would get to a POC, but we wouldn't really know what we were going to find yet. So there was always this phase of like, okay, I'll show you what you expected to see. Here's the data. It's searchable. You know, here's your web logs your you know, firewall logs, et cetera. And then, you know, the uh, technical sort of stakeholders, you know, okay, that, yeah, that's cool. I get it. You can help me store that and I can search it. But then we'd say, okay, cool. Check it out. Here's what you didn't know to look for. Did, are you aware that, you know, there was a, a login, you know, to your firewall from, uh, from, you know, Bahrain or, or, you know, Japan? Um, like, no, man, we don't have anybody in those places. Okay. That's because you, you're sifting through this giant mound of data. You're trying to find the needle in the haystack by searching. You can't do that and by gradually eliminating other stuff, you know, and that's where the light would start to go off. And say, oh man, okay, I get it. You can help me understand the, the world that's out there. And, you know, based on that, we began to refine some use cases. And I think that helped um, solidify the sales process. There was also a guy named James Hollinger who I worked with at, uh, at, at Blade Logic. He was, a, I think he was a Java engineer when he joined, you know, later moved into sales engineering. He was a, a tremendous um, asset to Sumo as well. He, was, he moved out west. Uh, I think he lives north of San Francisco, but uh, oh, yeah. uh, he, you know, another great guy in that sort of uh, uh, early, you know, group of people. Mm. And uh, I suppose in terms of, um, you know, just going again, looking at the kind of the recruitment element, um, you know, you obviously just, you, you referenced James, who's someone that you would have worked with, obviously part of the Blade Logic team. Yeah. Um, what, <clears throat> You know, what, what, what was the kind of the strategy there with regards to kind of, you, you brought quite a lot of the pre-sales guys um, from Blade Logic. Was that, was mm. that part of the strategy, get as much of the band together and continue to grow from there? Was that, was that the play? Um, so I'm just thinking for a moment. Um, it's been a while, you know, and I'm kind of old, so bear with me. Um, I think actually it wasn't so much... Uh, a a, a uh, relationship strategy, although that certainly helped. For me, it was a natural um, alignment with the skill set that those folks had. Because, you know, I look at um, Mike Lupiani. I mean, this guy, he's incredibly smart. He works, he's got a tremendous work ethic, but he has a hugely broad set of skill. You know, and I saw that from day one with him um, when we hired him as, as, a, as an SE, you know, I think he was consulting for IBM, but he knew systems, he knew networking, he knew security. I mean, he just was very, very broad. That was a key element at Sumo because we had this universe of data. It could be app logs, it could be firewall, it could be from some like temperature sensor device, you know, in a basement. And so that ability to approach a broad problem kind of analytically and say, okay, I understand, you know, this whole bunch of stuff. Now let me try to find value. That was a very natural um, uh, problem for the blade logic sort of uh, profile to solve. And so, you know, that was the primary driver. Of course, it was awesome to know a bunch of these people and know, you know, that how, trust them, et cetera. Um, so it was a really sort of natural alignment. Sure. So how did your management start to evolve at this point? 
you know, historically compared to at this point? Yeah, um, I sort of laugh because, you know, in the early days, I was probably like a, a combination of a chainsaw and a machine gun. You know what I mean? Just full force, you know, ahead at all times. And, um, you know, that's maybe what was needed. I was young, you know, nobody uh, in those days or at small companies, nobody sort of gave you like, all right, here's the, here's the, how to become a manager and 10 easy steps. Um, I think I, I, I later came to realize that, you know, pushing while important isn't the only thing, you know, that helps someone become an effective manager. <laughs> There's a lot more to it. Um, earning trust and respect and showing, you know, the people that work for you, that you work for them is those are critical and showing them that um, you've got their interests, you know, at heart along with the interest of the company and, demonstrating compassion and, uh, um, you know, that those all help to build a stronger team. And, and I learned that um, at Sumo, I, I really, you know, learned it, um, you know, quite a bit very recently or, you know, over the past two and a half years, a guy named Ed Philippine, he was the, the CRO at Cloud Health, you know, stayed to run sales for, you know, two years or so at VMware just a tremendous guy. And, and I think, you know, every, every time you move to a different company, for me, it's really important to take something away, you know, and, and for yourself, like something that you learned and that um, ability to lead with um, compassion as well as passion was something I learned from Ed. And, and it's, I just think that's incredibly, you know, valuable. So um, yeah, I, hopefully that gives you some sense of the evolution you know, over time. <laughs> Well, that's actually now part of your playbook. Now you, you you've uh, you've highlighted that as a, a real kind of key component. Yeah. Yes, it, it very much so. I mean, I think about you know that was probably the the first point I mentioned. You know, lead with compassion and with heart as much as you know with uh, you know fist. <laughs> I think is probably what I said. Um, and then I think operate with urgency. You know, like don't wait if you if you feel something is nagging you, you know, it's, it's late at night and, and you get this nagging sense of something's not complete, you know, just take care of it because that makes all the difference in the world. In, in, a, in a funny way, this industry is a, a game of inches, you know, as we say about American football, you know, and um, that tiny little difference might make a huge impact later and in ways that you might not realize. Um, and then I think I also talked about, I remembered something that Dave Itacheria, you know, our, our CEO back in the blade logic days. And of course now at Mongo, he said, um, that stuck with me for a long time. He said, you know, he was like, Damon, you operate like a shareholder and not like an employee. And I thought, man, that's a real compliment. You know, I, 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 I sort of understood it then certainly understood it later. And, you know, I like to use that line because I think it, you, you're, you're, a member of the family, you know, um, although I suppose maybe that's a bad analogy because it's hard to become not a member of a family. But anyway, the point is, you know, you're not just paid nine to five to do a job. You are helping drive everyone's success and you take that responsibility personally. And I thought that was a really concise way to say it. Mm. Right. Sure. Fantastic. And um, so August, 2016, you, um, you decided to move on from Sumo um, I believe you you worked for a couple of startups, Aseti Software, Clear Sky Data, yeah, that's right. prior to, to Cloud Health. That's right, yeah. Um, Aseti, you know, Steve and I, Steve Strahan and I joined Aseti. It was a very, very, um, again, a niche kind of solution focused on improving performance with parallel workloads, parallelizable workloads. And I guess the quick version was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you might have a processor with two cores, you know, maybe, you know, maybe just, a, or you might have two physical processors, you know, now you can get a 24 core chip, you know, and you can stick two of them in a box and you've got 48 cores. Well, you know, anyone who's sort of looked at the performance characteristics of, of software knows that um, you, let's say you go from one to 48 cores. Well, 
your performance is not going to improve by, you know, a multiple of 48, not even close. There's like this leveling off because there's more and more overhead associated with, you know, distributing and managing that workload. Mm -hmm. So a SETI, um, uh, there was a, a guy named Lawrence Ho who had this idea of say, you know, could we add a software layer between, you know, the, the application and the operating system, kind of like a, think of it as like a C library, like a shim that, you know, expresses um, system calls and um, or exposes them. And could that essentially create these little virtual silos of networking queues, you know, a core, you know, basically resources that could streamline the operation. It's a very cool idea. It worked for a number of use cases. You know, I remember testing Nginx and we'd see like a, you know, 300%, you know, throughput on serving up data. Um, you know, this is where... Um, things take a, a sort of unfortunate turn, but ends up, uh, well, uh, Cheng Wu, uh, Chen, he was, you know, he's like a tremendously well-regarded, you know, um, entrepreneur in the Boston area, Arrow Point, he sold for $6 billion to Cisco. And, you know, there's all these articles in the globe from back in those days, the $6 billion man, you know, really, really humble, super nice guy. He was a huge force in, in driving the investment, you know, and, um, you know, kind of leading the company. Um, his wife became ill and, and uh, um, you know, he had to step away from the role. And essentially that, you know, the investor said, okay, without you, you know, we can't really continue. Thankfully, you know, Helen, his wife is, is, is fine now, which is awesome. That's the most important thing. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's one of those, you know, time the market sort of things. And um, unforeseen circumstances occur, you know, <laughs> so, but again, you know, you roll the dice and, and uh, you know, sometimes that happens and I'm just most thankful that everything's okay, you know, with Cheng and his wife. Uh, so yeah, that's what happened there. And then um, Clear Sky, you know, I had worked for Ellen uh, uh, at Cloud Switch. Yeah. She um, founded a company with a, a guy named Laz Vecurides um, focused on exposing enterprise storage backed by the cloud. So there was this very cool, um, architecture associated with that, you know, we would expose block storage on the front end. There was this cache device on the back end, you know, we'd have ethernet private lines connecting to a nearby data center for like really low latency um, uh, IO. And then that would sort of queue up in batches and push the data to an object store like an S3 or an Azure blob, you know, um, very cool, sort of like infinite storage um, performance as well. Mm. Uh, that was early, you know, <laughs> I mean, very early yeah. though they were, uh, acquired by Amazon and now Ellen is the GM of their, uh, their storage gateway product, which is awesome, yeah. uh, for her that they, you know, kept the team. Um, but man, it was early and, uh, you know, this is another area where I think, you know, relationships are so important, um, uh, you know, at one point, you know, we had to make some changes, you know, in, in the organization and Ellen, um, you know, came to me and said, look, Damon, um, uh, you know, I didn't expect this sort of result, you know, at this time, um, you know, I, I, she very thoughtfully, she said, if you, if you feel you need to look elsewhere, you know, I, I absolve you from <laughs> responsibility because she knew, you know, I was kind of, I'm a pretty loyal guy. I don't know. I've been in the Boston area too long. I've maybe seen the town or the departed too much. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I felt this sort of strong sense of responsibility, you know? Um, so I was very thoughtful of her. I mean, you know, I stayed with the company, but mm -hmm. right around that time, Phil Pergola, whom I think you've spoken with, reached out to me and he said, Hey man, I'm over at cloud health. It's pretty cool. You have any interest? And I said, yeah, okay, let's talk. And, and, uh, whatever serendipity again um but anyway that that sort of led me to uh to cloud health yeah yeah fantastic and i don't believe you were there too long before the vmware acquisition yeah it, sort of hysterically maybe i don't know six months five months something like that mm -hmm. um i often joke people might say damon you got unbelievably good timing okay so others might say man you got the worst timing i've ever seen <laughs> i actually you know i think at first, I sort of thought, man, I wanted to sort of build something here, you know. I, I didn't expect this to happen so quickly, but VMware was actually really good to us. They, they uh, gave us tons of resources. I probably hired 35 or 40 people over the two and a half years there. We built out 
um, APAC, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, um, India, Japan, mm-hmm. um, you know, hired a bunch in, in Europe and of course in the Americas, uh, expanded to LATAM. Um, so I, VMware w- was great, man. They, they, uh, Mm-hmm. They gave us resources. They sort of left us alone, let us do our thing. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, the timing worked out. Um, you know, of course, had equity and, and that converted and, you know, uh, uh, was beneficial to me. And so I have no, um, you know, I have no sort of ill feelings toward VMware. Um, and maybe that's part of, you know, maturing a little bit and looking at the BMC days and sort of contrasting and, and uh, you know, trying to, to learn, you know. <clears throat> Mm. It, it's a little bit ironic because you obviously fled from BMC, acquired <laughs> by Verizon, to then be acquired or just leave just before an acquisition from AWS yep. to join a company to be acquired by VMware <laughs> to finally make your way to lace work. But you yeah. mentioned earlier that you know the timing between getting you know being too early and at at the right time. So to kind of frame lace work, so you've just had series C 74 million funding. Yeah. You've got the likes of Mike Spicer, yep. um, you know, Sutter Hill right behind you. Right. Andy Byron at the helm, um, you know, introduction from McMahon. I don't know whether he's actually on the board. I'm, I'm not too sure whether he, he is, is, but it, he is. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, does this seem like the right time to be, you know, at lace work and what, what's the mission? And so I'm thrilled to be at Lacework. I got to tell you, it, it, Andy, um, I'll, I'll answer your question, of course, but Andy, um, he, he summarized this really well for me. Like we were talking, I think last Thursday or Friday and, you know, he's just saying, how do, that was my first full week, you know? And he said, how's it going, man? You know, what do you think? And I said, man, I'm thrilled. I'm excited. It, all of the, the structure and the, the sales methodology and messaging <laughs> is familiar. You know what I mean? It, it's, but it's sort of updated for um, cloud and security. You know, Andy's, Andy's, he's just amazing in, in that, you know, I knew him from 10 or 15 years ago where, you know, he was sort of taking the McMahon playbook and running with it. That's not the case now. He's, he's got his own playbook and um, just, it's just awesome to sort of see that um, growth and change. Not that he's not, uh, you know, influenced or, or sort of, you know, aligned with, with John, because that, that, you know, that's clearly the case, but, you know, he's really, you know, kind of doing his own thing, so to speak. Um, now to answer your question, uh, there's a guy, uh, you know, on the, on the SE team, uh, Chris Marcotte, his name, he's up in Montreal. And, you know, I met with him shortly after I joined and it's, you know, we have the elevator pitch, we've got the, you know, longer term pitch, et cetera. But Chris really summarized it, you know, in like, the three second version. Cause I said, what do you tell, you know, your spouse or, or a friend at the pub, you know? And he said, Lacework solves security issues from a data point of view. And, you know, I sort of stopped and I said, huh, well, tell me more about this. And he's like, exactly. You know, that's, that is precisely the point. And obviously I'll, I'll talk more about it, but um, it, it is a big data approach using machine learning and artificial intelligence to identify patterns in data related to security. And you can't solve this problem any other way, particularly when you look at the rate of change in the cloud. Look, if you had a data center that was very well structured, very well controlled, you wouldn't need the engine and the machinery that you know we can bring to bear. Um, but that's not the case. We're selling to people who they are cloud builders, um, they are growing rapidly. They're innovating 10 times faster than you might have seen 10 years ago. Um, their rate of change is off the charts. And some of these things are ephemeral in nature. Um, you know, they're, they spin them up. They run for an hour or two. They're back down. You can't track that through a traditional uh, security tool. Um, you know, there's a guy named Chris Pettigo, you know, the field CTO. Um, super smart guy. Just presents really well. Um, I think he said... You know, in the old days, we would talk about finding a needle in a haystack. I talked about that at Sumo. He said, well, what if you have to find a needle in a pile of needles? <laughs> you know, sort of an unpleasant image, I suppose. But um, it, I think that at least captures the nature of the problem, which is you need, 
you know, a, a machine to provide this intelligence for you. You don't know what to look for, and we will tell you what to look for. And we'll provide visibility and context over this stuff. So that, that keyword context is really important. I can tell you, all right, there's an event. There, there was a root login, you know, using your, your root IAM credentials, you know, f- at this time on this, from this IP. All right, cool. Is that good or bad? I don't know. Well, let me go find out where, what the IP is. Where does it come from? Were there any changes associated with that? That's hard work. That's, that's essentially, at some level, breach analysis. Um, and it, it, that requires expertise and a lot of manual labor, et cetera. Lace work automates that for you. We have something called a polygraph that will literally sort of highlight, you know, there's the noise in the background and we say, okay, here are the five connected things that, um, bring clarity to what happened. Okay, yeah, there was a root login here. Then there was an IAM user created, a policy applied to that. Prior to that, there were, you know, 10 failed logins. You know, this came from, uh, you know, who knows, uh, you know, Switzerland, when you have no one, you know, in Switzerland. Um, So it really, it tells a narrative and provides context that I think is incredibly valuable. We've also got a single sort of interface across a number of use cases, whether it be cloud, host, you know, vulnerability analysis, uh, container image scanning, which is just in- tremendously valuable. Nobody else does that. I mean, we'll look at your your repository of container images and say, okay, you've got these 12 CVEs um, that, you know, you're affected on this particular uh, container image. So very, very um, modern architecture, the platform, you know, scales to support the level of data that we see coming in from modern architectures. And, you know, we, we've well established our ideal customer profile, thanks to sort of Andy and, 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 you know, team, um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be there. And the point is Andy sort of said, you know, man, you're home, you know, <laughs> and, and in a way that characterized it perfectly because of all the sort of familiarity um, that I was experiencing. So Mm-hmm. Hopefully I didn't ramble on too long. <laughs> no, it's, it's perfect. And um, absolutely, um, a lot of the things that you've touched on, as you, you know, just to reiterate, are obviously very relevant to the modern enterprise or the, actually the enterprise of the future, which I think is probably even, even, even more important. But, but it's interesting, Damien, because you have obviously gone out to the world. You know, a lot of your, your, um, your, your peers have stayed within the network, whereas you've mm-hmm. kind of gone in and out. So... Yeah. Uh, being within that comfort zone again, does it, does it kind of feel, you know, are the pieces coming together? Do you feel that comfort that you can now go and build and, and, and you know, you've got that kind of synergy that you can go and create something pretty special? Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I am, the, the future is wide open. We are scaling rapidly. Um, you know, I talk to, to candidates all the time and, and I can, I can, you know, the passion I, I sort of have and feel, albeit early for me, because, you know, I, I'm still becoming entrenched, but the passion is real and they pick up on that. And um, I think having left the, the sort of network and, and come back, I've, you know, I've built connections, you know, and um, that's just, it's great. You know, I mean, whether at, at Sumo, um, you know, I think of a guy named Jim Wilson, he ran sales for us, you know, and uh, Jim, you know, is at a, um, venture ca- a VC firm, Costa Noa out West. And so I call him, you know, just for sort of thoughts and insight. And it's awesome to have expanded that network um, because it gives me just different perspectives, you know, which I think are really valuable. Um, but coming back with Andy and, um, you know, McMahon and Spicer, both of whom were, were on the board at Sumo as well. Um, it just, it feels like a, I don't know, a natural, um, next step for me or, or a return maybe if that makes sense and you know not that everything's perfect you're always going to face challenge and you, you just have to solve it but uh yeah it, it feels quite natural for me <laughs> mm, fantastic and um obviously your career is is continuing to evolve damon um up to date uh, through lace work but looking back just for our our viewership and, and for the pre-sales community as a whole, what, what do you think are the, the key characteristics that have enabled you to, to really scale your career in the way you have? Oh man. Um, Quite a broad. I'm never, yeah, I'm, I'm always, you know, you ask my wife, I don't really 
she, if she wants me to talk about myself, it's you know, so I'll talk about what I've done and you know what I what I think about you know others and and, and particularly their their the traits that allow them to be successful. But it's much harder to sort of point that inward. I guess um, you know I talked about intellectual curiosity and uh, an openness to do I to, to new ideas and, and new concepts. You know I, I don't I don't I like to challenge myself and I like to just try different things, you know, we moved, I mentioned, you know, or, or maybe not, we, I moved to a, a new house, you know, about a month and a half ago. And, um, you know, I needed to do some work, you know, in the basement. I've never repaired, I've never hung drywall. I don't know what I'm doing, but I needed to try it. And I said, Oh, I'm just going to get some drywall and hang it up. My wife's like, you crazy. Like, well, <laughs> why don't you have someone who knows how to do that? Do it. And I'm like, look, I like figuring things out, you know, and I got it attached to the wall. It's perhaps not, you know, uh, up to top tier <laughs> standards, but it's a wall, you know? And I, I mentioned that because for me, I just like challenging myself and learning new things and exploring. And so I think that's enabled me to succeed. It's not that I'm, I'm fearless because I've certainly had my moments, but um, you know, I, I sort of have faith also that I can figure things out, you know, given enough time and resources. And so maybe that's allowed me to succeed. I think, you know, being um, technical in nature, you know, there's a reason I, I gravitated toward the sales engineering sort of career. It's really an awesome, you know, career because you get, you know, the exposure and you get the sort of uh, control your own destiny a bit that often people in IT want, but they don't really know that there's an option for that. But I get to retain, you know, a hand in technology, which is something I enjoy. So, you know, I suppose there's that. And then, um, you know, work ethic and, and uh, uh, drive. I don't know where that comes from, honestly. Maybe it's my father, who knows. I, I usually have a, um, a picture of him. My father was in Vietnam, you know, he was in the infantry carried an M60 through the through jungle in 69 and 70, some really tough times. Usually it is behind me, but we move and I can't find the picture, which is <laughs> sort of bothering me. But there are times, you know, when I sort of, um, you know, I get, yeah, oh, man, this is tough. And I often just look behind me, you know, <laughs> and see see him with a, with a machine gun and, you know, see his, uh, his purple heart. And, you know, I said, okay, he did that. I can do this, you know? So maybe there's perspective and, and uh, the work ethic, you know, he instilled of, you know, if, if I'm not doing everything I can, if I'm sort of taking my foot off the, the, you know, gas pedal, there's, there's just a pit in my stomach that it doesn't feel right, you know? And, and I just, I don't know, maybe I'm uh, un, unnatural in that way or, or something, but I just, I can't, let it go, you know, and so maybe that's helped me as well. <clears throat> mm. yeah, great. So the final question we uh, ask on this, uh, on the pre-sales uh, series is what technology or area of innovation do you think will have the biggest impact on um, business in the next decade? So yeah. What's your thoughts on that? I think, um, you know, traditional storage, Lots of racks in a data. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, sorry. I wondered how long I could go with that before you guys you know, hit the stop button. Um, I, obviously, we've seen the explosion of cloud computing, you know, that has just unlocked rapid innovation. I mean, you know, we look at the Ubers of the world and DoorDash. I mean, the restaurant industry, obviously, in, in the U.S., I, I won't sort of veer into politics. I know that's dangerous territory, but clearly, you know, there's some trouble related to our, our current epidemic. Um, but you've seen restaurants, you know, a, 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 an industry that, you know, you wouldn't think of as, as massively um, technical in nature, but they're finding ways to, to reach people through the delivery services. And so in a way, Uber Eats and DoorDash and the like, they've, you know, helped many of these restaurants you know, survive and they're built all on, you know, cloud computing. So I think you've got that on one hand, that's an easy answer, you know, uh, you know, stand anybody up in front of a, a, a an event and cloud computing. Okay, great. This is the smartest guy in the world. Um, I think I, I'm also a little biased because I'm excited about the machine learning and the artificial intelligence work that Lacework is doing. And, um, uh, so the combination of those two things in the security context is really exciting to me. 
again, you've got tons of investments in AI and, and ML, easy buzzwords to say, but man, I really think that there's something there, you know, <laughs> industry-wide, not just specific to, to security. And a lot of other people feel that as well. So those two come to mind. Um, I, I think about blockchain. I mean, that's a real buzz term. And I don't know that anyone's got it right just yet, but I don't know. I sort of see that finally going somewhere, whether it's voting or like real estate transactions. There's some, you know, people doing interesting work there. Steve and Derek from, from, you know, Fuse, you know, they've, they're heading up separate companies. One's an infrastructure provider, you know, that's pure stake. And then Algorand, you know, Steve's heading up at the application level. So that's maybe a little earlier in terms of finding real sort of practical value, but I think we're going to see that, you know, finally, you know, deliver on some of the promise, you know, everyone uh, uh, hyped. So there's two and a half, maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's great. That's uh, yeah. very, very uh, insightful there. So thank you so much. So I, I suppose in the way of a summary, uh, Damon, I think, you know, if, I, if, I, if we were to kind of really reflect on what we've heard today, it's interesting some of the decisions that you've made in your career of, of what steps to take and how they actually match up with a lot of your belief system. Because, you know, you, you talk about, you know, in your playbook, um, you know, be a shareholder, not an employee. Being in that startup environment, and, sorry, and the other one would be in urgency. So being in that startup environment has given you the opportunity to operate where you feel valued, where urgency counts for something, um, and your natural curiosity to create and tinker and work things out, I think is is really the reason why you've probably taken the, the journey that you have. Um, and in an interesting way, unlike many of the others we've spoken to, those traits have enabled you to thrive outside of the comfort zone. And even though you've now returned back to, you know, back to your home, back to the playbook, you've been able to go out to the wild and survive and more than survive, create an amazing career because you've been true yeah. to, the, to the elements that underpin, you know, who you are as a person. So, you know, on that, I just want to say a big thank you for taking the time to speak with us. It's been truly, truly amazing. So many of the guys uh, that we've spoken to speak so highly of you, both on the sales and the pre-sales <clears throat> side. I know you've had a tremendous impact on many of those guys as their manager and mentor. So, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. I mean, very, uh, very thoughtful. Uh, thank you for the kind words and, you know, for the kind words <clears throat> from everyone who's who said them. Nobody, nobody achieves anything in life without some help, you know, <laughs> so myself very definitely included. So uh, anyway, um, any opportunity I can give to, to offer that is, is that's the best part of my, of my, my job and my privilege, you know, to, to work in this, in this industry. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for joining us, Damon. It's been really, really fascinating. My pleasure. So to our listeners, thanks for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed the session. Um, please don't forget to subscribe. Um, there's lots and lots of content available on our website. Uh, check out so much soap.com forward slash blog. And we hope to see you again for another session very soon. Take care.